Intel personnel, stealth protocol. Run silent, black alert. Be bold, be brave, be courageous. Black alert. This ship bears the name Discovery. Never has that been more fitting or more prescient. All right. Let's fly. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Last Days of Disco Podcast Festival. Uh, we hope you've been enjoying it. We're a couple of days in now, um, and we'd like to welcome you to our Captains of Discovery panel. The chair is yours. And I am your host and moderator for this one, Julian Brown. Uh, if this is your first time tuning in to the Strange New Pod YouTube channel, I'm the creator and host of Strange New Pod. And I'm delighted to be joined by a panel of just amazing Star Trek podcast hosts, and uh, I'm going to introduce all of you. Uh, I'm going to go in the order of the captains that you're going to talk about. First up, we have Ryan from Yum Yum Pod, who will be talking about Captain Lorca. Uh, we also have uh, Joe from Captain's Quadrant, Heather from Promenade Merchants Podcast, who are also going to be talking about Captain Lorca. Captain Lorca being a very popular topic to talk about for this one, uh, as Thanks. he should be. Yeah, <laughs> as he should be. <laughs> Uh, Drew and GD from yet another Star Trek podcast are here. They're going to be talking about Captain Christopher Pike. David Majors from the Promenade Merchants podcast is also here. He will be talking about Captain Saru, Captain Saru of the Discovery. And last but certainly not least, we have Mariah Gossett from Star Trek Discovery Pod, who will be talking about Captain Burnham. Um, as you guys know, the USS Discovery has had a slew of of captains uh they were even supposed to as ryan mentioned before we started a vulcan captain who uh never made it on board uh so there's definitely been a handful of people who have taken the center seat but i just want to say it's a pleasure to to have all you guys how are we doing today awesome good thanks Great for having to be us. here it's yeah. a bit windy a bit Let's rainy and I'm, I'm making it happen <laughs> yeah. it drops away <laughs> His the podcasting rain. is famously an outdoor up. activity. Yeah. <laughs> I don't well, recommend I like it. to keep my window open, but not today. <laughs> the rain is bad today. I think that's yeah. universally everywhere today. So Yeah, we're getting yeah. torrential rain here. Yeah. 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 yeah it's flooding. Well, well, normally Texas sucks, but today's been great. Today's a beautiful day. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful day. It sucks for you guys. I'm great. It's sending them back. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> um we're just going to get right into this and we're going to talk about captain Lorca. Um, Heather, you had requested that I play uh, a speech from, I, I help me with the episode title for this one. I forget. Uh, um, into the forest. We yes, go into the forest. We go right before they jump to, to fight the, the Klingon. Uh, the, it was the, was it the, uh, the sarcophagus ship? Yeah. The ship yeah, of the dead, the ship of the dead. So I'm going to share my screen here. We are about to face the most difficult challenge we have ever attempted. Today, we stare down the bow of the ship of the dead. The very same ship that took thousands of our own in the battle of binary stars. When I took command of this vessel, you were a crew of polite scientists. Now, I look at you, and you are fierce warriors all. No other Federation vessel have a chance to pull this off. Just us. Because mark my words, you will look back proudly and tell the world you were there the day the USS Discovery saved Pavel and ended the Klingon War. Definitely one to get you fired up there. Uh, Ryan, you've been messaging me privately. You've been emailing me. You have just been like Lorca, 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 and I'm I'm just gonna let you go at it because I know you've been waiting to talk about it. What did you think of Captain Lorca as the captain of USS Discovery? Um, yeah, he's okay. Uh, imagine <laughs> if that was. Imagine <laughs> if that was All right. What? I want to know what the hell is going on. <laughs> oh, oh, nice. No, of course, nice. of course. I think he's a really fascinating character. I infam infamously. 
I have a lot of problems with Star Trek Discovery. Uh, I, I, it hurts my brain many times over. And I think a lot of people, even on this panel, when starting the series had some issues, like, oh, the Klingon design, oh, I can't watch it. But for me, what always kept me through was the familiar face of Jason Isaacs. He's such a talented actor, and he's bringing his usual malevolence and charm to this character who's on purposely mysterious and dark and brooding, almost to a comical degree. Like, I remember laughing so much when we first introduced him, and he's sitting in the dank darkness of his of his of his ready room and he's just eating fortune cookies and talking about context being for kings but once you kind of move past that um almost like cliche like villainous captain stuff they really started to introduce some interesting layers and and wrinkles and i must admit i like Lorca more as like this morally ambiguous captain who offers ideals that challenge the normal starfleet way of things more so than the, oh, he's secretly a mirror universe uh, counterpart. But that's still a fun twist and reveal. Like, that's a fun, like, oh, what if we did this type of thing? But Lorca is just, he's probably one of my favorite antagonistic figures of Discovery because he has such a personal relationship with the crew. He challenges each one of them. He forces them and molds them into things that they shouldn't be but also makes you question isn't that some part of them deep down and that's kind of tied into the whole mirror universe thing of like well you know that's the flip side of how things go so Lorca is a fun character he's got the you know he's got the southern fried accent that you just heard there Jason Isaacs dusting off his same accent from the film Soldier I laughed at that too uh, but I just like this character I liked how for that first season it, it was very much kicking people in the face of what to expect from a Star Trek show. There's a, We still hear it now, even from me on the occasion, of just like Discovery not abiding by what people expect of Star Trek. And I really felt like Lorca as a character helped kind of solidify and justify why, the, why Discovery as a series was approaching it the way it was. Because, again, as you reveal, this is a captain, this is a character who does not represent the usual ideals and stuff, and yet he is of prominence, he is of success, he is someone that is looked favorably upon in that universe, and what does that mean? Like, how do you how do you feel about that? Like, a lot of people compare him to Jellico, but I also think of him as, like, I can't remember the captain's name, but uh, Miles O'Brien's former captain in the first Cardassian mm. episode, yeah. where you have, oh, like, yeah. this... Was it Pressman? Mm -hmm dramatic war-torn figure yeah oh, i forget his name that was a great episode yeah but, uh, you know that oh, kind of character we all go look it up now but uh <laughs> he's the warden from shawshank redemption right uh but yeah I, I like i like this character a lot and uh i'm a big fan of jason isaac so there was just some some real like cred, street cred to this character of like oh you got dignified actor jason and he took his shirt off at one point so it made us all happy <laughs> Drew, did you want to say something? Yeah, Benjamin Maxwell of the Rutledge. There it is. Yep. <laughs> it's on the Benjamin. tip of my tongue. Sorry. Yep. <laughs> nice. Um, I'm going to just go by uh, order of who's on screen. Heather, you had me play this uh, this clip specifically and wanted to get your thoughts on Lorca and especially why uh, this clip. Okay. So I, I think this clip in particular really is a huge example of the effect that Lorca has on the crew of the discovery. Uh, because to me, I mean, you can like, you can look at Lorca as a villain, which he ultimately ends up to be, but you can also look at him like Ryan was saying as that morally ambiguous captain who really brings out qu qualities in the crew of the, the discovery that they didn't know they had to start out with. And that's really the example of what he's saying in that speech. Like when I first came here, you guys were polite scientists. And then like now you're warriors. Like he really brought out a, a fierceness in a lot of them in various different ways that 
isn't necessarily negative, even though Lorca is kind of a negative character. Like it, it's something it, it shaped them as characters, which they then take on through the rest of the series. And I think that's important to see. Um, I think Lorca would not be the character he is without Jason Isaacs. I think we can all agree on that. If Lorca was played by any other person, it would be like a lot of people would have an entirely a different opinion of him uh, because he's played by Jason Isaacs. Just the balance between positive and negative and good and evil, that line is walked so well that I, I, there's not very many people that can do that. And Jason Isaacs is one of those people that does that very well. Um I also think one of the interesting things about Lorca is that you have to wonder, especially realizing that he is ultimately from the mirror universe, you have to wonder exactly how similar he is to his counterpart. Because I, I, I think that they have to be two people that are similar in a lot of ways in order for him to pull this off and really fool people for so long like there were a lot of similarities in their characteristics and how they dealt with situations than like other characters we had seen from the mirror universe before and and that's an interesting concept and not something most people would consider yeah, I've I've always had the the shared opinion. I I think with a, a few people that Mirror Lorca and Lorca, who we never get to meet, are very similar people. Um, maybe even almost the same person. And I, and 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 one thing that both of you guys have been talking about that I think is really interesting is that we yes he he becomes a villain right at the, when we when we head to the Mirror Universe. This whole thing's been a giant scam. But at the same time, I think there's a part of Mirror Lorca that really, that really becomes invested in the Klingon War to the point like I think he still wants to get back and you know take over and defeat Giorgio. But I think there's a part of them that if he knew that he could never go back, that I think he could be resigned to that. Like he has something to give in this universe, despite the fact that he's still not a great human being. Well, I think he, because he comes from the mirror universe, right? Like violence and war, I think makes sense to him on a yeah. deep level versus yeah. perhaps what a prime Lorca would have encountered. And like to y'all's point, like there's obviously similarities between the mirror and prime versions of all of the characters, right? It's like whatever version of these dark corners of your, of your humanity that you decide to embrace and like, depending on the environments that you're growing up in, it's like what you're going to thrive in. I do think it's really interesting for, for Lorca though, uh, Mira Lorca, or at least the Lorca, the only Lorca we know, um, <laughs> is like this dedication, I think, to one, finding a way back, but also making sure that the situations that he's put in are always places where he's going to thrive. It's spaces of violence. It's spaces where his expertise is going to come in handy. Um, and he's obviously someone who knows how to blend in and to uh, be tricky and and conniving and uh, find ways to get what he wants. I mean, the entire reason we even have Burnham is because Lorca was like, oh, my space crush is here. I'm going to find a way to keep her on the ship, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and thank goodness. Cause then now we have captain Burnham, but it, it is an interesting thing to think about, about how selfish a lot of his intentions really were, especially considering the repercussions for people like Stamets and for the rest of the crew when yeah. they do make that jump. Um, and I think we see some of those parallels, uh, as well as in Giorgio, we can make those assumptions based on what we saw of prime Giorgio versus mirror Giorgio. Yeah. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Um, Joe, want to get yes. your your take on Captain so, Lorca here? Yeah. So when he came off the Event Horizon, I felt like no. Um, so that's a <laughs> wow, great yeah, so reference. Anyway. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Nice to nice. be here. Okay. To be guys. Um, no, I I really appreciated Lorca because I love villains that think they're right and spend their entire progression in ensuring that what they believe is the call. Oh, is a cutie. We got a special guest in the pod here, uh, but their the, their main goal is to achieve 
all of their purposes in their mindsets and almost have a cult-like leadership about themselves. And I think that that's what his, his biggest strength was. He can rile up the crew and he can get them ready for battle, but as all cult leaders are, it's, it's follow them to the end in their manner. And that's what I loved about Lorca. He has this, the riz, so to speak, the charisma that is needed to bring everybody mm -hmm. up into that point and get his goals achieved and take over with no prisoners. So I, I really like that about them. And I always thought he was, would have been a great James Bond. And I felt a lot of that swagger that he brought to the role was really showcased in this uh, season of Star Trek Discovery. So oh, Lorca was aces in my book. And I was sad to see him killed in the series. Spoilers. But because uh, I really wanted to see him come back. Yeah. But, I really wish know. that we had gotten can. him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Lorca is still alive. He's man. out there somewhere. No, I really wish. I think it was a missed opportunity for him to not have shown back up in Terra Firma parts one and two in season three. Um, yep. But mm. you can't have everything. I think, so. I think that's why people like Lorca so much is because of all these things we've said, but also the Prime Lorca stuff isn't a joke. Like, I think everyone, you like, pretty much anyone, everyone universally agrees that the answer that they gave for why we don't see Prime Lorca is bullshit. Like, everyone kind of just goes, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna listen to that. Oh, what no was the answer? Like, I, over there. I never heard this. What was the answer that they gave? Oh, they give a no, no, no Starfleet officer could survive in that universe. It's like, why? Why? Kirk managed just fine. I, I like, I, it's just one well, of those things where they just. <laughs> It's I mean, like the when, entire what happened to the, the mirror discovery. universe discovery. Oh, it just blew up when it arrived. It's it just now it, no one accepts the answer. So everyone just kind of goes, we want Prime Lorca because why not? It's now it's a, it's a mystery left to be solved. Like who who is he? He's gonna show up in the next season. Now I okay. know the novels aren't canon, but did anyone else here read the Discovery novel that featured Lorca? I still because... want to read that one. There is a chapter at the very end of it because it is very much prime Lorca because it's Lorca in his younger days and it connects back to a TOS episode, not giving any spoilers if you haven't read it. But there's a chapter that's included at the very end of the novel, which is prime Lorca sitting in a prison somewhere in the mirror universe oh okay so i know the novels are not considered canon but prime lorca is still alive i think in my the book. new trek can uh, the new trek novels are considered more canon than the previous ones i think they're trying to yeah. go by them as much as possible so yeah yeah so. um anything else on captain lorca before we move on to captain pike Oh, I've got one thing. I think yeah. that's interesting on a revisit. So with our podcast, we were revisiting it. And the allure, the, the charisma, the riz, as we said about the character and Jason <laughs> Isaacs, and, and the mystique, the mystery. But something that I found to be overwhelming is his, and I don't use this phrase lightly, I mean it on purpose, but he's a groomer. Uh, oh, 100%. In many different ways. Yes. Yes, uh, and that I didn't notice okay. in my first watch through in in the in the most explicit way, but also in the various ways. I just thought of him as like, oh, he's the villain captain or the morally ambiguous captain. But I th think it gives that first season like this under like really serious thematic undercurrent throughout it of just you're watching this captain groom his way to the top and like his weird psychosexual relationship with Michael that is not. A talked about too much but enough and okay. it was just something that i found impactful very impactful yeah that's it yeah. I, I, I was just saying it's very impactful like that 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 hit of him being like this very insidious figure on a more personal level than just evil captain who's going to tell you to commit war crimes yeah yeah <laughs> so next up we're going to have drew and gd from yet another star trek podcast we're talking about captain pike the whole reason uh strange new pod is is around uh so uh i i love me some captain pike uh who uh drew or gd who's going first here let me sit up for this one <laughs> well <laughs> so i i think um you know before we dive into the greatness of pike i, I just want to make a comparison to uh the captains of disco to the doctor who uh in a way like my first doctor was christopher eccleston right my and right i I love him. Uh, he might be my favorite, but yeah. I think the best doctor is David Tennant, right? Yeah. And I kind of have the same vibe with Discovery, right? 
Lorca was my first captain. He's my favorite, but the best captain is Captain Pike. Yes, one hundred percent. Just because he got a spinoff. Uh, <laughs> well, that's no. part of it. So if we so uh, the term Riz was just thrown around to talk. About, You're welcome. Uh, uh, the, the term Riz was thrown around. I'm sorry, uh, man. This uh, Pike has more Riz than Lorca, though. Pike can cook. Pike does can he? sing and dance. He does. Well, that, uh, that's later on. Though. I mean, it's in the hair. Discovery. It's, 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 it's the also hair. the hair. It's oh, it's God. the salt and pepper. <laughs> it's it's he's he's Zaddy. Pike he is, is Zaddy. Zaddy. <laughs> yeah. Zaddy. Yeah, he is Zaddy. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, Pike was exactly what the Discovery needed, right? Yeah. They had just come off of this. I mean, truly emotionally. Uh, draining experience with Lorca and as much as I I think Lorca was right 100% for everything he did he did nothing um, wrong he did <laughs> nothing wrong I, you know we're all in agreement about that but uh you no know ones are the ones that think they're right exactly you know uh in any case they he came in with a softer touch he realized that he had a crew on his hands that had been damaged by the things that they had just gone through in the mirror universe and he was empathetic uh, he was transparent. He was willing to listen to his crew instead of giving the orders. He was willing to take suggestions in a way that Lorca wasn't right. And, and, you know, maybe being a wartime captain, it doesn't afford you those luxuries. Right. Uh, but it was such a change of pace. Um, and, and really that's that soft touch. I think that uh, discovery needed at that yeah. point. And Lorca, Lorca uh, Pike was 100% aware of his own mortality. Mm. You know, mm. he's fully aware he's operating on uh, on borrowed time, more or less. And I think that just made him a better captain for it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, once once he had seen his future, you know, um, that, that brought a, a, another side to him that I don't think uh, was, was quite there, you know. And, and like, that's not to say that he wasn't, you know, cognizant of his duties as a Starfleet officer. Obviously, yeah. you know, he was he was aware of what his responsibilities were, but he did it with empathy and, uh, you know, upholding the codes of Starfleet that, you know, we've come to love from watching, you know, 50 plus years of this amazing franchise. And, you know, Lorca just kind of shattered all that. So it, it was kind of like coming back to the sense of familiarity with, with Pike, uh, like that warm security blanket in a way, you know? Yeah. Um Pike is Pike was a palate cleanser for Discovery. He was the thing he was that interim captain that nobody really expected to love, <laughs> but we loved him. I loved him. I still love him. So, <laughs> one one of the Daddy. things that that made me fall in love not just with i mean i knew anson mount from hell on wheels which is in an amazing series Ooh. so when he when he got cast i was just like let's go but one of the things that i thought was so refreshing and especially if uh, talking about novels heather if you've read the enterprise of war yep. this version of pike is a version of pike that's still very much the the boy scout captain right but this is also a version and you see it a little bit when he snaps at michael he has a bit of a bone to pick with starfleet he has a chip on his shoulder because starfleet made them sit out the klingon war so he's him and the crew have like missed out on so much and and you see him really just like wanting to get back into the thick of it and i i just really i really like that version because just re-watching season two he is a very different captain in season two of Discovery and season one of Strange New Worlds. Yeah. And, and, and I found that I found that very interesting. But, you know, this is also a guy when we see him do that, that speech is going to I'm not Lorca. Right. He shows his history for everybody. He jokes with the crew over these few up ep these episodes where he's captain. He's able to, you know, regain the trust of this crew and the kind of the ideals of Starfleet. So. Anson Mount killed it in the role. It's a great character to pick back up. I always was fascinated with the cage. Um, so, yeah, I love it. It's it literally, it's, you know, the reason that this podcast is here today. We we did it because Stranger Worlds got picked up. That was the dare. If they did this as a spinoff, we were going to do a show, and that's what happened. So thank you, Anson and Captain Pike. 
Uh, good reference on Hell on Wheels. I thought you were going to say I knew him back when he was Black Bolt on Inhumans. Oh, in Inhumans. I was yeah. thinking that too. That's hilarious. Yep. Yeah. No. In Inhumans. I, I knew him. And I felt so bad for him. So they gave him this uh, opportunity. Crossroads. crossroads. That's right. Crossroads. Ryan. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Yeah. Um, anything else on Captain Pike? Uh, he's a fantastic cook. He is a fantastic cook. And he, and he can cook the, the cooking was was. Strange New World sees him. I true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's true. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. But still, yeah. he's, yeah, no, he's, that was he's, much true, he's a fantastic cook. You saw glimpses of his hospitality once he like redid the ready room on Discovery. And... Brought in his grandfather's table. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. You know, it was, yeah. Now he was you know making right. the, the dinner table. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> just, he just really he wasn't quick, cooking. Just really quick on that, though. So he's making these meals. Is he replicating the ingredients? Like, is he saying to the replicator, hey, give me green peppers and red peppers? Or I feel like like call captain's captain's privilege on that one. I (laughs) feel like Captain Pike, yeah. Every captain has a little stash of something somewhere. Yeah. Captain Pike gets fresh goods in. And I think he's the kind of captain that if they come across a ship, a ship that has goods, he's using like, you know, other species ingredients and like doing some trades. I think Captain Pike is that kind of captain. Mm. I liked in Discovery that he had to be a mediator. Mm. That he was the guy that came in and he had to listen and weigh up all of the options, which is very Star Trek. When when Lorca was very much my way or the highway. The other thing I liked, it was mainly in one episode, but I liked when he was religious for that one episode. And you, yeah. you didn't remember that when he was yep. just, I, 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 I mm-hmm. and then it went away. <laughs> um, and I also like that they gave up on dyeing his hair after a certain point. Yes. Like, yeah. it, it, we can't, we can't be bothered. <laughs> pepper. Yeah. Salt and pepper is the way to go. It's it's the reason why Drew's beard is getting all that salt and pepper. You know, that's right. Well, I think to, it was like a, yeah. a really cognizant choice from the um, costuming department. Just shouts to you know the many hands that it takes to make yeah. make all of these shows. The, the many yeah, hands Gersha's... that it takes for Captain Pike's hair. Yes, oh and and he said that many times that it is all them, but. Um, they really let the salt and pepper come through after he saw his future. And I thought that was really right. smart in how Ooh. they yeah. use that as a storytelling device, I think. Um, yeah. And just, I, I did want to push a little bit of like some of the choices towards the end of that <laughs> season with him of not teleporting the Admiral out of the bomb area. You know, there's just some, oh, there's some blind yeah. spots that I thought. <laughs> We're blaming worry, that on that, transporters that weren't working. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh he's, man, that was that was tense. I, that's one of my favorite scenes. Is when they're the count of the but clock he is can ticking be just the on the other off. side of that blast door and watch it explode, right. even though it's good. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, we just did you? a rewatch on our on our our, our podcast, mm. and I was like, "What? Why did you do this?" <laughs> he's, yeah. he's got yeah. stronger eyes than Tuvok because it didn't blind him to look at that. Unlike with Tuvok, yeah. when that happened to him in Voyager. Yeah. <laughs> Vulcan eyes. Wow, this is gonna be me. She gonna blow up. I can't turn her away. I can't turn away. Like, yeah, stronger oh. eyes than Lorca as well. Remember Lorca's also. Oh, man, you really, yeah. really got Okay. All right. So now I'm going to have that. And did anybody get Johnny Bravo vibes from Captain Pike? From the Pike? hair. <laughs> it's I mean, the hair. The, 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 it's the, the hair. hair. And the upper body. Yeah. Is upper but only body when he's wearing compared. the gold uniform. Yeah. Only yeah. When he's wearing the Especially gold. when he's wearing the gold uniform. Yeah. yeah. We, got, uh, we got Johnny Bravo versus Johnny Jane Bravo. Bond. Come on, guys. Oh, what do we call him? Zaddy, right? Zaddy. He's Zaddy Pike. Yeah, Danny Pike, Space Daddy. Uh, anything else on Captain Pike? Anybody? Good. Let's uh, move on. David from Promenade Merchants, you would like to talk to us about Captain Saru. I would. Uh, for me, in many, many ways, Saru is the heart of the USS Discovery. Uh, he is sort of the day one of Star Trek Discovery. He was the polite scientist who grew into something more. Uh, And on top of that, Saru was kind of a groundbreaker in the fact that for as long as the Star Trek franchise has been around, we do not see alien captains very often. It doesn't happen often. And the fact that we saw Saru go from one place on the Shenzhou to becoming a captain, uh, I think that really says a lot about the growth and the depth of Saru's arc. Uh, I think uh, maybe, and this is just to go along with the Doctor Who analogy, 
Uh, Saru is my Peter Capaldi. Uh, he's Ooh. he's he's nice. not everybody's favorite, and I get it, but he's mine. He's definitely mine for a lot of reasons. Uh, Saru had a unique relationship with so many of the characters on the Discovery. Uh, he was a counterbalance to Michael Burnham. Uh, he was the first person on the Discovery to not look at Tilly and see her as just this annoying ensign who didn't know how to keep her mouth shut. And he was the first one to say, okay, you start talking when you get nervous. It's okay. Go ahead and talk it out. Which clearly, e even for an alien who hadn't been around humans, he, he sort of got how to reach other officers and help them kind of grow and perform and be better. And that relationship between Saru and Tilly really had some definition throughout the, the entire series. And Saru also going out of his way, knowing he's the first Kelpian in Starfleet, wanting to make the best impression possible of being a model officer, of learning different languages, and really going out of his way to go the extra mile for the crew of the Discovery. So early on, uh, when season one ended, my first instinct was Saru should be captain. When Captain Pike showed up in the beginning, I felt like, eh, they're, they're, they're playing it safe. They're going the safe route. Star Trek is playing it safe again. But over time, we eventually got to see Saru in the captain's chair, which made me really happy. And later on in the seasons, Burnham taking command of the Discovery made sure that Saru was right there with her, maintaining that balance that those two had. And Saru has just had this incredible character arc as a father figure, as a captain who could stand up to bullies like Giorgio and Tarka, and I just think that overall, in the four seasons of Discovery, Saru has become one of the most complete characters in Star Trek in a long, long time, and seeing an alien character that this doesn't happen with very often in Star Trek, I just think that's really, really cool, and to cap it all off, when Discovery was first announced, and the role of Saru was announced to be played by Doug Jones, yeah. I immediately knew. I immediately knew this was going to be great because yep. Doug Jones as an actor, as a performer, as a physical actor, as a creature actor, he is second to none. And it has given everyone an opportunity to show the full range of Doug Jones's talents. Uh, in costume, out of costume, Doug Jones has been nothing short of a tour de force. And he has made Saru into a really special character in Star Trek. And seeing Saru in the captain's chair made me as happy as I could be. It's funny because when, uh, when they announced that Discovery would no longer continue after the fifth season, I was most sad about not having more Saru. Because that's the character that I was like, you know what? From the beginning of the series till now, that's my favorite ca character. Captains, Lorca, but, you know, characters was always Saru. Because, you know, he has an emotional connection to the Vulcan later on. His own species, the, the reigniting of it, the power of his sister coming to save the day. In the Such Sweet Sorrow Parts 2. There was just so much with Saru that I loved and would die for, like, a Star Trek Saru, you know, if they want to listen and uh, take notes. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a feeling, I, I mean, I've been making big predictions over on our podcast, over on Discovery Pod, um, because they're setting up the Academy series, I think, to also mm. take place potentially in this universe. And it feels like they've definitely, like, to your point, the arc of Saru is so compelling and it's gone beyond, I think, his desire to be like, I'm going to be a traditional captain in the chair of a starship and instead playing this part i think of like 
intergalactic relations, if you will, and seeing, I think, some of the power that can come from his perspective and his abilities to see such complete pictures as a character. The honored um, elder. Yeah, very mm -hmm. much that. It's like I could definitely see that character like very easily being inserted into an Academy series as a regular guest star spot. Well, he's been a mentor, you know, from day one to just about everybody that he's he's been with, you know, even even Burnham, who he was at odds with uh, quite a bit in season one. He's grown to be a mentor to her. So it wasn't just like Tilly, you know, it's the entire crew. He, and and I, I agree with you. I think in the in an Academy series, he would be right at home, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Could you um, remind me, oh, sorry. Is he is he a linguist? Is that one of his specialties? Yeah, he he's knows thirty something languages. languages. Yeah. yeah, I mean, um, he's the I one who that, did Ten C. Yeah, yeah. And I think that mm. ties into what I like about his character is he's always trying to find ways to communicate, uh, mm. and his lack of confidence and how he grows in confidence. That's the arc I love about Saru. Is he's a very nervous character to begin with. Like he's good at his job, but. He, he he doesn't know how to do things, but he wants to learn. He wants to figure out the words, figure out the vernacular, even jokingly figure out a catchphrase at a certain point. But I loved in the early days where he would ask ask the computer for advice of like how to do things. And I think that's what made his arc so satisfying as like a as a captain role per se, because most of the Starfleet captains that we have as mainstays are confident, they're experienced, mm. they know what they're doing, they're the best of the best. Maybe Janeway is the kind of one that has to catch up because she's kind of caught blindsided. She just started, then she gets thrown. But like, I love with Saru, we see three to four seasons worth of him getting a groove and getting an understanding of something beyond just the textbook. Instead of just being able to read about it, instead of just being able to learn about it, he actually experiences it for himself and he becomes his own person he's not just going to be a lorker he's not just going to be a pike he's not just going to be whatever he's going to be his own thing and i like the idea of him slowly becoming like a spock type in which in their later part of their career they move beyond being on the starship and become more of a, a diplomatic person well, he's he's like the most human out of anybody on the show in the same way that spock was you know it, it's funny how star trek has a way of communicating humanity through the non-human characters the best yeah that's an interesting take yeah yeah um, I I feel bad for Saru, if that makes sense. I feel bad for Saru because 100%. Saru does such an amazing job getting this crew through um the the season two finale and being that captain, right? Um, and and I think that had they been able to stay, Saru does get made captain of that starship, and I think he succeeds. I think he does so well as a 22nd 23rd century captain like that is where he belongs right he's a, he's a peacetime captain i think he he's the type of captain who would love to do first contact missions second contact missions just ex like doing a five-year mission right unfortunately when when they get into season three and you know michael i think you know and, and I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about this with mariah a little bit but you know michael just says no to the chair and I think Saru feels a little bit like she was going to take it and he's caught a little bit off guard. He's, and he's also caught off guard in a universe that is just not built for him to be a captain in yet. I think eventually, as, as we see too, in, in later in season three and into season four, that he does adapt to. But I just, it, it it's sad in a way that he doesn't get to stay and be a, a, a peacetime captain, right? Mm -hmm. I think uh, because he's definitely not as sure as himself as he was in season two during bits of, of season three where, you know, Vance has to talk him down on some things and he doesn't even bother listening to Michael when she has to go help book. You know, mistakes made on both of their parts in, that, in those situations. But um, I think he was just very caught off guard where he was going and being a captain of the starship in that time. His relationship with George Al is interesting as well. It's actually yes. my favorite uh, dynamic for George Al, where she has to be the, the you could uh, you could say the devil on his shoulder, but yeah. that's the thing. He's in a he's in a time in which she actually makes sense. Like unlike in season two, where it's like he just would roll his eyes, be like no, we're not going to blow up a star, you know <laughs> that type of thing. But then there in the third season, 
she actually offers points of view and gives him the idea of the Starfleet way won't save you out of this bar fight, Saru. You have to actually shoot darts out of your head. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, that I thing. always appreciated the, the alien species that he was because um, you guys can correct me. Usually I lean on my co-host, Jason Roy Gaston, to help out here. But I don't recall the, the Kelpians in Star Trek prior. This is a no, new this species. Is, no, Saru was yeah, the first. first. Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's the first. Yeah, so um, I I thought that the genesis of their species was amazing, and the fact that they were prey for another species was also an interesting dynamic because now you have a subspecies to a point uh, coming out on top and being kingmakers in the future. So I, I find that to be very fascinating about that species and his character. Well, and what's so great about the time jump? Sorry, Heather. the The time jump was Saru got to see the Kelpians and the Ba'ul coexisting, right. which added another layer of depth to his character. Uh, he, here we are in this new time, a thousand years in the future, where Saru is in one way looked at as a, a great elder of a past mm -hmm. time, but now he has to struggle with adapting to this time where the Ba'ul were his mortal enemy. But it's not like that anymore. So seeing his perspective evolve in season four was also really an interesting watch. Heather? But there was also like his evolution of being like the first Kelpian in years to evolve from that prey to predator state because they their society had grown to the fact that the Kelpians were always prey. And once they hit that evolution point, then they were kind of slaughtered and so Saru was the first person to go beyond that and to realize that at one point the Kelpians were the predators in that dynamic and the bowel restricted them so that 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 was kind of another part of his his growth in understanding that he was not always meant to be prey and that he could have stronger more confident instincts and those were okay those were not against his nature um, anything else on Saru before we move on to Mariah and Captain Burnham? Last thing for me, it's an it's a simple thing, an obvious thing. His look, the design, is simply sublime. Like it's so detailed, so alien, so abstract, and yet Doug Jones brings that raw humanity to the role where, you know, he can act through all of that makeup. You need someone who can do that. And he's the most alien looking alien crew member we've had in a very long time and i love that he has hooves and i love yes. that he has ganglia yes. and, I, and love I love that walk these. yeah and, and you get to see him with his shirt off even like they go to that mm, extra detail do. like they're not going to just keep it like the the head and hands they're going to go to these places and you know we're, we're near the end of the we're wrapping up discovery and i'm still impressed like every time he's on the screen i'm just like this is still i'm just gonna say it, fucking impressive like what what a creature what a design and what a what a character and doug jones brings that, that you know that i i want to say like he brings that old old star trek acting feel to it just the way he he's cadence and, and the way he has that very mannered talking style it just feels like you're 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 back at home again when every time he's on the screen i just i just love the design i love that acting i love his voice i just yeah, it's just a simple thing, but it's just an obvious thing to say. He just looks cool. Yeah, yeah. he does. Um, I will say, if you've not gotten or read this, uh, Star Trek The Art of Neville Page, Neville's the one who's behind Saru, and he's mm. got a great just pages and pages about the Kelpians and Saru in here. He's a genius. Uh, read this book. Um, last, certainly not least, all of these captains served in that chair so we could finally get to Captain Burdom, Mariah from Star Trek Discovery Pod. Uh, you are talking about Captain Burnham today, and I know you've supplied me with some pictures and some uh, some video clips, so you let me know yeah. what you need from me. But yeah, Captain I Burnham. Like I dropped a I dropped an extra one in there for you just a moment ago, so I don't know if oh, you did can you? pull it up, but it's the first one that says adding one um, from the start, just because I thought if we're going to talk about captain speeches, this is actually prior to Burnham being a captain, but I think was our 
head nod that that's where we were going right at the end of season one. Did you throw it in the um the, in the outline? The outline. I think outline. for me, Burnham is well. One, I love Sinequa Martin Green. I think she's an incredible actress and is bringing something that's so um nuanced and beautiful in her performance of this character who is holding so many different identities at once um she's someone who's suffered such immense loss she's some, someone who's had to grow up in different multicultural environments and i think we haven't really seen a character like burnham before and we've also never seen a, a full captain's arc i think in this way where we have truly started from someone who we perceived as this very measured number one character who had like an immense fall and then has to literally build from the ground all the way back up and I think Burnham is really that full exploration of what it takes to get to the point of leadership and how to rebuild trust with people when they've lost your trust and I think that's such a beautiful story to tell for a character and for a captain to say that you don't have to start as this perfect character you don't have to start from a place of um, exacting leadership from the beginning and that it actually takes great personal growth and great change to, I think, become a well-rounded uh, captain. And and I'm, I'm mostly sad the series is ending because I feel cheated out of getting to see her be a full captain in this space that she now has control over. I'm really excited for the new season because I think we finally are going to see Burnham truly as a, a as a captain. I think this last season there is still that leadership push pull with her and the president and with the admiral, with Admiral Admiral Vance, um, in in figuring out how to be a Starfleet captain in this new age and in this new time. And and I and I hope that this new season really gives her the space to like show off her captain skills because I think from this very first scene that we're going to kind of watch you see that it's there and then it just takes the journey of confidence and experiences to really land the starship if you will even so I come to ask myself the same question that young soldier asked the general all those years ago how do I defeat fear the general's answer the only way to defeat fear is to tell it no no we will not take shortcuts on the path to righteousness. No, we will not break the rules that protect us from our basest instincts. No, we will not allow desperation to destroy moral authority. I am guilty of all these things. Some say that in life there are no second chances. Experience tells me that this is true. But we can only look forward. We have to be torchbearers, casting the light so we may see our path to lasting peace. We will continue exploring, discovering new worlds, new civilizations. Yes, that is the United Federation of Planets. Today we honor Ensign Sylvia Tilly accepted in the Starfleet Command Training Program. Yes, that is Starfleet. Lieutenant Commander Paul Stamets. Medical Officer Hugh Culver. Yes, that is who we are. Commander Saru, first Kelpian to receive the Medal of Honor. And who we will always be. That's one of the best Star Trek speeches ever. Yeah, absolutely. I know that yeah. the first time I saw that speech after Discovery season one was such a such a thing. Well, that when, speech yeah. made me feel like, you know what? We're going to be all right. Yeah, we're going to be and okay. I, and I feel like I always feel like that with Michael Burnham. It's like the journey might be rocky. And of course, like there's so much to consider, I think, with the series as a whole, with how many different showrunners there were. And there was a lot of turmoil in, in the, on, the, on the creative side. But yes. the port in the storm for me has always been Sonequa Martin-Green. Like her performances never lack. I think she has dealt with a lot from the fandom with such grace and humility and understands the importance of who she is and the figure that she plays in her representation on this show. 
And I think to me, what I've enjoyed the most is seeing an imperfect captain and a captain who's willing to embrace the imperfections because that is what's going to make her a better captain. And, and so I think that to me has always been the constant. I've also really enjoyed how she has genuine friendships with this crew. Um, and there's the picture I, I sent to you, Julian, of, of her and yep. um, Saru. Mm -hmm. It's when he is losing his ganglia <laughs> and he's essentially like, I trust you to essentially take my life in this moment so that I no longer suffer. And even with their ups and downs, to me, this was that bi the biggest shift in showing their friendship and how close they really were is he said, I can see that you and I don't always see eye to eye, but have such deep, profound respect for each other. And I've really enjoyed seeing the two of them grow together as captains and as leaders in Starfleet. And so I think their journeys are so firmly intertwined. Um that even when, you know, we brought it up earlier, when Saru does get that captain's chair when they go into the future, to me, it was because Burnham had just spent a, a year without Starfleet and was like, do I like who I am without Starfleet or do I want to be back here? And because that question, I think, was so posed for her, she knew she couldn't take the chair in that moment. And to yeah. me, that is like such a responsibility and incredible grace as a leader to say, I'm not in the right headspace to do this, but I trust you. And I know together we can make choices. Um, so then it just becomes even more sweet. I think when she does reaffirm it and we can maybe go to, um, the clip of, you know, I'm kind of skipping around a little That's bit. That's okay. When we jump into the future and she lands when she is still firmly in here, the joy that we see on her face when she realizes that the mission was successful to me is the joy that we then see, I think, in the um, the fourth clip I sent you. Is there life here? Anywhere? Multiple life signs detected. Yes! Ah! Ah! Yes! <laughs> I mean, I was ecstatic for her in that moment too. You know, you're like Sonequa oh. Martin Green, man. She's oh, like goosebumps she's, every single time. Every yeah, time. she's so good. She Just, never misses. She no. never misses the nuance that she brings to the performance of someone who has to be struggling so much internally, but be so graceful on the egg. It reminds me of like, like a duck, right? Swimming. You have to have that constant churning underneath, but on the top of the surface, it looks smooth and like nothing's really going on. Um, and Sneaker Martin Green just delivers it every single time. Um, and so I think when we get to her finally taking the chair, that very last clip, um, to me, it felt so earned and sweet that I, I was so ec ecstatic to finally see it. Everybody ready? Yes, yes Captain. Captain. Let's fly. Like goosebumps still. I get them every single time. Also, let's fly is a great fucking catchphrase. So it's good one of the best. It's one of the best. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Can I just say I'm really disappointed they didn't go with those uniforms? The grays the were gray really ones? nice. I know. Yeah, I know I they like clash with the design of the I ship, do. but yeah, I'm them. glad I, I think design wise it was the right choice to go to some I agree. colors yeah. because the grays of the ship, were nice but... though. I, I um, do love the red. I do love the command red. The command red. And it's like a nice nod to the movie uniforms in a way, right. especially when yeah. they get the dress collars yeah, underneath. Was... Anyway. Yeah. Um, um Mariah, if I could interrupt you real quick, because I, yeah. I, I I see Heather feeling things and I just want to give Heather <laughs> yeah. a, a quick opportunity <laughs> to talk because I get it. Like I I've been getting goosebumps this whole time. So I want to give you a quick opportunity. What's on your mind? I, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I just get I, I get so emotional with some of these moments because it's like I love this show so much. And these moments, especially with Michael, are so earned. And when you like you finally get to see them happen, it's like you can't help but get emotional. I'm like sitting here crying on video. Yeah, I love it. But it it's it's it's. It's one of those things where like, especially a show like this, when you've been with it from the beginning and you watch them go through so much and then you see like the pure unadulterated joy, like in that clip from season three or like her finally sitting down in that captain's chair. Uh, it, it just makes me emotional. Yeah. No. Yeah. I, feel I mean, 
I, I think it's like, you know, my gateway into Star Trek was Janeway. And so I think to me, seeing another woman in the captain's chair is just always going to be that moment of like, fuck yes. Like it, yeah. it it's, you know, I hate to be that person who's like, I mean, actually, I don't like the no, power of representation yeah. is yeah. really fucking important. And so like Sonequa Martin Green, I think just like knocks it out of the park every time she so upholds like the values that I want in a Star Trek character and as an actor who brings like her full self to this character. I just so appreciate it to the point where like that final scene when she's like, let's fly. She is pregnant filming all those yep. final episodes of that oh, season, yeah. which includes oh, yeah. all of the stunt work and fight choreography with Osira. And it's just like, she really nails it. And I also wanted to talk about, she is a bad ass captain. And so I want to go to this third clip because even from the beginning, getting to see her play with fight choreography with Michelle Yeoh, always my favorite fucking episodes. <laughs> oh yeah, here we go. I accept your challenge, human. <laughs> Like that little head shake, the jaw waggle going right in to be like, let's keep okay, it going. Let's fucking go. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. Let's <laughs> go. All of her fight scenes are incredible. And I think she just does a great job. And it's like, it's fun because we always got, I don't know, you saw Kirk fighting like the big bads all the time. Like Janeway to me had some of those moments, but it was always far more intellectual battles happening on Voyager. So to see a captain who gets to literally be physically badass and mentally badass is like an incredible combination. Um, and before we jump to like other, like, I'd love to hear everyone else's thoughts as well. I grabbed a couple of listener thoughts from my patrons um, and I just wanted to read a couple of them. Uh, this one's from Takako who says, one of the pleasures of the series is started by focusing on a character who is not the highest ranking character in any given scene has been watching the developmental stages of a Starfleet captain. In previous iterations, we would occasionally see these captains' younger days in flashbacks, but we meet them as fully formed leaders. With Michael Burnham, we suffered through her failures and celebrated her triumphs and watched her learn to be the leader in her own way. Of all the captains we have met and loved, Burnham may have the distinction of being the one captain who we can say we knew her when. Perhaps some of the characters from Lower Decks or Prodigy will share that distinction with her someday. Um, and then Karen Chu says, Michael means grace to me. Her whole arc was about grace. First learning to give herself grace and then learning to give others grace. Her fierce self-driving mania, surely born of trying to be a Vulcan, something she innately wasn't and earns Sarek's approval, is seen from the beginning and she's just as hard on those around her. With her rock bottom crash, she sh slowly crawls back up, learns to ease up on herself, and what is really important, she becomes a really great leader, not just what she thinks is a great leader. Damn. So anyway, yeah. I love Michael Burnham. Captain, I, my captain. I love Michael Burnham as well. And there's something with Michael that always sticks out with me, and it's from the season three episode, Die Trying when they're trying to earn their way back into Starfleet because Admiral Vance is like, well, technically you're criminals because you time traveled here. And meanwhile, this speed, this, these, um, you know, there's a, a crew that's dying because they can't get to the seed vault. And Michael's like, we have a spore drive. We can get to the ship, like use us. And Saru, I think is like a little bit hesitant, but finally is like, yeah, Vance gives the okay. When Michael, steps foot on that bridge and starts commanding that crew is when she is going to be the captain at the end of this season she 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 has so much respect for those around her right and and is so just everything that you want in a starfleet captain you know and and one of the things i absolutely love about that scene is that the entire time that she's in command of discovery she doesn't sit in the chair because even though she's in command of that, she has respect for what that chair means and she's not there yet. But it it's so powerful, right? Because she's she's she has uh Lieutenant Will on there and she's gotta like prove herself. But 
she is so calm and collected. It, it never, ever phases her. And it's one of my favorite Michael Burnham moments ever. And I'm, I'm so glad because I didn't, I was hoping, I always hoped that, that we would finally see her in the chair. And I, we were talking in our watch alongs. I was always a little disappointed that she doesn't take it in the second episode, but when it finally does happen, like, you know, Heather getting emotional about it, like, you can't see him. I have tears in my eyes talking about this right now of her being in that uniform and just finally getting that spot. I think it should have happened sooner, but that episode really just like made it for me. And, and she is just such an amazing captain. And I think, you know, when, you know, I show my kids this series and people later down the line show their kids this season, the, you know, the series, Michael Burnham is a character and a captain that kids can look up to. Um, and and I, I love the character so much. Also, I think she did nothing wrong in Vulcan Hello. On my rewatch, did no. nothing wrong. No, no nothing I say wrong. that all nothing. the time. Not no. deserve not, that. Yeah, no, nope. nothing she at all. Didn't. She definitely didn't deserve yep. a life sentence. Absolutely right? no. not. No. No, that, was that was such weird. bullshit Starfleet. Um, Maybe yeah. six months. Yeah, Michael, yeah go ahead. I'll, I'll hang, if it wasn't I'll for hang. Lorca, uh, <laughs> Michael Burnham would still be in prison. Yeah. yeah. That's yeah. also true. Yeah. yeah. Hey, that's why Lorca's awesome. I guess. That's why Lorca did nothing wrong. Lorca did nothing wrong. Um, so there's a lot of similarities between one of my best friends growing up, who is, uh, one of the, my groom's woman is a Starfleet captain. Sorry. Yeah, no, she's not a Starfleet. <laughs> just a nurse. I don't know. Hey. <laughs> but, uh, Very seeing important. the similarities in facial structure and mannerisms and movements, I automatically was like, Oh, I absolutely love this character right off the bat. And I hey. took me a second to warm up to Picard uh, which is surprising for a Star Trek fan because everybody's like well Picard's awesome and he's the best and he's the best speaker the speech uh, uh, captain and everything nah. it took me a minute it was a, a, an adjustment because I had watched so many years of Captain Kirk being you know sachet and Kirk Fu and everything but with Michael Burnham being that ultimate badass as you said earlier as well as having so many similarities between one of my very best friends it just felt like I was part of the crew and here's my best friend as the captain, like I would always want. So I absolutely love Burnham and her decision-making. I know that she gets emotional and some of the folks always have that gripe, but I think it's justified because look what she's accomplished. Look what she's gone through and look how she's handled it and just leads with a smile. She's absolutely the epitome of what somebody should look up to and one day become. So when Nichelle Nichols was, often told by fans that uh, they were inspired to become space folks, astronauts, as they're known commonly. Uh, <laughs> I like space uh, folks. I'm using I, I like space that. folks. Yeah. Space <laughs> folks are cool. <laughs> I'm going to make that a shirt. Um, I think we're going to have a lot of, of folks coming up to Sinequa yeah. in, in the same vein. They're going to become you know, space force captains. There we go. That's what it is yeah. nowadays. Mm. Yeah. Beautifully said. Yeah. Anything else on Michael? Good good um we did get some questions from the strange you pod discord channel and i want to get through some of those mariah i'm gonna ask you first um we had a question and i know we kind of talked about this but maybe uh everybody can get it on this uh from catalactica 3188 do you think michael should have been made captain at the beginning of season three i think she had the option and turned it down and i think you have to know yourself first and so Yes. As a viewer, would I have loved to have seen her as a captain sooner? Sure. But do I think the character arc is better for it? Yes. So I think um, I think she took the captaincy when she was ready to take it. And that's what I would prefer in a captain. I want someone who actually wants it. Right. Yep. Awesome. Anybody else have an answer that they want to give to that or keep going? I think the fact that she turned it down at that moment showed her growth as a person because like, I would think like even like from the very start of the series, like the first person time you meet her in the Vulcan hello, like that Michael would have taken the captain's chair, but everything she went through through season one and season two and that year she spent in the future like helped her grow as a person to know that she wasn't certain if she was ready for that and that's why she didn't accept it at that point and so I appreciate her growth as a person more for the fact that she turned it down in that instance yeah. 
Mm. Yeah. She was uh, stripped of the disciplined life that she had led before with growing up on Vulcan and being a staff lead officer and being George Jow's number one and then lost all of that and had to define herself by something else. Who is she when she doesn't have that structure, that format to guide her? And so when you get to season three and she's been a way in which Starfleet and all that doesn't even matter, exists, does it even serve a purpose? I think it just better reinforces why she doesn't take up the responsibility again straight away. Yeah. Let's go through more of these questions and uh, just feel free to answer them as we go. Uh, we had an Eric the, uh, from Eric the Red a question about Lorca, Prime Lorca. We kind of talked about this at the beginning. Uh, what is the actual fake of Prime Lorca? And get crazy. You can get crazy. You can make something wild up. Uh, who's got something for this one? Oh, he's, he's in Section 31, and he's going to pop up at the last episode <laughs> of Season 5. He is the, the, the be-all, the end-all villain that we always wanted, and it's going to shock everybody. Get ready to get your socks blown off. Do like you think Lorca that, that Prime is Lorca with is more evil? The koala. <laughs> yeah, right. Lorca's with, Lorca's the koala. with the koala. <laughs> I would love nothing else for that him to show kind of... up in Lower Decks in some way, shape, or form, and it would be oh the my God. perfect yeah. way to do a weird little fun cameo. Yeah, <laughs> I, love it. I think love it. Prime Lorca is the sex slave of Mirror Cornwall. <laughs> yep. Yep. He's, he's a oh my he's god! A uh, sure. Death he's by Snoop Snoop. Yeah. He's, a, yeah. Yep. he's in did the you, were, Did you have one? Uh, no, I'm. I'm gonna go off of the Death by Snoo Snoo. Uh, <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Prime Lorca. Death by Snoo Snoo. I like it. I like it. Um, this is a great question from uh, Colin D, uh, also one of our patrons. So thank you for this one. Uh, I think quote unquote acting captain ensign tilly far exceeded expectations initially she acted unsure when first sitting in the chair however when push came to shove she was authoritative authoritative knew what to do uh or sorry knew what had to be done and had no hint of self-doubt in her voice her crew followed her with pride what say you totally agree especially when we have that episode in discovery where she's with the cadets and the, the uh, shuttle pod crashes and yep. she has to take lead. You see that the uh, same as akin to that moment uh, where she's going to be, I hope in my heart of hearts, only one, believe it or not, I'm not a time Lord, but <laughs> I, I'm really hoping that uh, she will be the, the pinnacle lead on the next series, uh, Starfleet Academy. And they're going to have fun with it, you know, because, yeah. Hey, who's writing it. It's not some stiff in a, a boardroom. It's our most beloved Mariner. <laughs> like, yeah, we, Tawny. we have an opportunity. Yep. Yeah. yeah, Tawny Newsom is writing Starfleet Academy, so it's not going to be a stiff show. I think it's going to have the right amount of humor and seriousness that's beloved in the Star Trek universe. So with Tilly, she has assertive command, and she has the Riz. I'm going to bring it back because we haven't said it. <laughs> <laughs> but I, and we're going to be surprised by her in Starfleet Academy. In my heart of hearts, I hope. Nice. I, like it. I will ahead. say oh. uh, I will take yep. the brave stance in saying that in the beginning of Star Trek Discovery, I straight up did not like Tilly. I didn't. But wow. I grew to love her over time. And controversial yet brave. As <laughs> Joe just described in that episode, I was so excited to see that side of Tilly because she was always in the early beginnings of discovery so unsure of herself mm -hmm. and as much as michael burnham i had always felt like star trek discovery was as much tilly's story as it was burnham's yes and her growth from beginning to now has been a joy to watch and i expect to see her uh, not just in Starfleet Academy, but in future iterations of the franchise to come. I expect to see her sitting in the captain's chair. I expect yes. it. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Drew, cake I saw you raise your hand. Oh, sorry. Yes, cake Drew. is eternal. Cake is eternal. <laughs> cake. I, I, I mean, I, I think Tilly did, uh, you know, an admirable job of, of, you know, performing in the role she was given. But to me, that was... I wasn't a fan. And again, not of how the character or the actress handled it, but it, it just, I'm, I'm one of the things I love about star Trek is that order of command, that chain of command. And I really mm -hmm. was against them jumping to an ensign 
uh, to be an acting captain, it felt like a, it kind of felt like a slap in the face to me. It was fine when Kirk did it in the movie, though, right? When no. He, yeah. <laughs> no, exactly. No, exactly. They've done this before, and I I understand that complaint as well. I I at least like that she was actively like one of her major arc points was she wanted to be a commanding officer. Like she was on the little program that, you know, the, the, the command track program and mm. she had been getting into her own little tests and then was thrown into actually being in the chair. My right. disappointment is once she's in the chair, she doesn't really do much. Like she cloaks mm. the ship and then doesn't even move the ship. <laughs> I, I can't get past that. Like move the fucking if ship. If one thing that Osiris says, and I was not a fan of Osiris as a villain, but when right. she's like bragging a little bit of how easy it was to take discovery, like she's, and I hate that she's right, but she's right. That being said, I think that that Mary and the character Tilly get a lot of shit for like what happened unrightfully by the fans. I thought it was a sweet moment. And I like specifically that scene when she is talking to Osiris via the view screen that you get a little bit of Captain Killy. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And she was very, uh, as Colin said, very authoritative in the role. Did she lose the ship very quickly? Yeah. But when your shields are down and they could just freely transport, you don't have a whole lot of options. So Move the ship. That's one option. <laughs> yeah. Move I mean, the fight ship. hand to hand if you have to. Yeah. You know, they, well, I don't think they, moving they the ship would have done anything because they would have just. But they went, put it in cloak. Gotcha. They put it in you know? cloak. Yeah. I'm I'm just saying that Starfleet has oh. a test for these types of situations. It's called the Kobayashi Maru, <laughs> and maybe <laughs> Tilly should have taken it. <laughs> oh man. Well, uh, well, she had to have because she graduates from season yeah. one to season two. So uh, look, if I didn't see it. see it, it didn't happen. Oh, okay. So. okay. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh. I guess you don't like Ray. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> oh, that was me. <laughs> oh my god. Um Trouble 2.0 asked uh and we did talk about this a little bit briefly at the top of the show as well. Was Lorca really a bad guy or just a man trying to get home to save his imprisoned crew? Why not? Uh, I got, Go I got this one. GD. Yep. I got um, this one. So, Lorca was a man on a mission. Lorca acted for the love of the game. So Lorca was not a bad guy. Lorca did what he needed to do in order to get things done. Uh, we said it yesterday, spoiler alert. Uh, in the game of chicken, Lorca does not blink, nor does he sway. No, agreed. Lorca was an old school, hardcore military man who yeah. was a bit grizzled. And to, to quote Jim Ross, he was tougher than a $2 steak. Oh, JR. And Good old JR. Good old JR. I, Good I think JR. that in a lot of ways, that was good for the crew of the Discovery, uh, who were polite scientists, who maybe needed a little more backbone. And Lorca got that out of them. Yeah. With so questionable sometime, tactics and morals. Just so hey, sometimes, yeah. yeah. Come on, Deep Space Nine in the pale moonlight. You have to do sometimes, sometimes everything that's not a good thing to get Sometimes the job done, you so. need a little old school grit and a little yeah. old yep. school toughness. I, I feel complicated about it because there's two versions of the character. There's the one on the Discovery where he, he's playing a role. And that's the one we're talking about primarily. Yes. And then there's the real Mirror Universe Lorca who is portrayed, and I don't mean this as a derision, he's an idiot. Hmm. Like, one of the last things he's told is like, we would have helped you, you could have asked. And you see this look on Jason Isaac's face of realization of like, oh, he didn't even contemplate such a simple thing. And like, he thinks poetry stupid and he's running around with a sword and he's just like a, like a, like Elon a jar Musk. head. Terran's going to Terran. So, <laughs> like, uh, Terran's going to yeah. Terran. Yeah. And so like, yeah. there's two versions of the character. And so the, 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 I, I feel complicated about that because I don't like the, the real Lorca. I think he's less interesting to spend time with, but that's the thing. Like the version we're talking about is like this act he's putting on with all of these layers and nuances. And then once he strips that away, he is just a man who's like, I want power because I deserve it. And also I deserve Michael as a trophy and I deserve right. to kick this yeah. person. So it's a complicated thing. Cause I also want to have that, like that fun conversation we're having, but also like the show itself 
draws a line in the sand at the end and says, nah, he was just a shitty dude. Anything else beforehand was kind of fun thought exercise, but he was just a bad guy. Yeah. It just- is really interesting when you go back and rewatch once you know the twist and you see how calculated all of these choices are. And so, yes, while they did like learn some of these big moral lessons from this big tough dude, his intentions were never actually good the and way I think that he me, manipulates Stamets right yeah, before yes, the, yeah. the last jump it's it is like yes to what end right it's like yes to what end is it worth it to to learn these sometimes lessons. ends justify terrible means he yeah. said that himself I, yeah well it, it, but and, and like when you I think talk that's about creative to not have anyway I, it's this yeah <laughs> Well, when you talk about his manipulation, particularly with Stamets, and it's not even just that last jump into the mirror universe, he he manipulates him at the start of that episode when he's convincing him to do all those micro jumps. And he pulls on like a scientist's need for exploration and it he uses the line and I remember when I first watched it because I got so excited hearing it for the first time in Discovery but the way he used it looking back at it it's like oh it, it it's so cringy now but when he's talking to him and he's talking about exploration and discovering new things and going where no man has gone before. And I was like, oh, yay, that's the, the Enterprise, the captain. He said the thing. He said the thing. He yeah. said the thing, yes. <laughs> yeah. But then, like, when you look back at his entire story now and how he used that to convince Stamets to really, like, put risk his own health and his own body to do all those jumps it's 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 cringy it's very cringy yeah. Yeah. Mm, it's yeah. about, glo- I, it's about thing- glory glory for Lorca. like a lot of his manipulation on the on the people on saru on stamets on even colbert is about like if you do this you'll be remembered you'll be yeah. important it'll yeah. be glorious and that's what he wants he wants yeah. to be this important figure one detail one little detail of love is that he keeps eating seafood and calamari and stuff because he really misses yes. eating Saru's people. <laughs> he no. He's what? constantly trying out different seafoods to replicate the taste, and that's a funny. De- that's one of the funniest things Discovery's ever done. A it's testament yeah. Sar- to Saru, though. After all of this was revealed, when he came up on the view screen, he said, "Saru, I missed you too." Yeah, mm-hmm. just a further mm-hmm. testament to Saru. Yeah. Further mm-hmm. testament. Yeah. Uh, one other you know thing I, about I, one other thing about Lorca that I, I think was kind of an interesting middle ground with all of this was the episode where he found Ash Tyler mm-hmm. uh, oh, in yeah. the Harry uh, Mud one, where he, yeah, the Harry Mud. Yeah. He definitely had a, a certain level of compassion for Ash Tyler uh, after seeing what he had been through and being stuck in that cell. And I think that Lorca, being a Terran, had a certain level of compassion for uh, a Starfleet officer who had been through a battle, a that's fight, what I, That's a what real I was trying war. to say. That's what I was trying to say earlier. I think there is a part of him that definitely came to care about the conflict. What you know? Yes, everything was a means to an end, but I think he did want to. I think because he is a Terran, I think Mariah, you were saying this earlier. He wants the glory of winning a war, right? Yeah. And I and yeah. I so I do think that there was some compassion and yeah. an understanding of of the fight. He's there. like, I understand war. I understand torture. This person's been through the things yeah. that I know about, and if you've survived all these things, then I can have a respect yeah. for you. Yeah. Um, one of the Joe, things I don't even mean to talk. It. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. There's just one one thing that always I I always have a mirror up against Gul Dukat when it comes to Lorca. Because I I feel like they have that the same modus operandi. They have the desire and the will to implant themselves on everyone, and what they're doing is right. And I think that's why they're some of the greatest villains. And I think that if Lorca was to survive somehow, or the Prime Lorca were to come back, we could have had some very epic moments, and it could have been the whole arc of the entire show. Is like we had to deal with Lorca this whole mm-hmm. time because that would be awesome. Terrible right? human being. <laughs> Yeah, somehow, somehow Lord 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 Lord. Oh my goodness! <laughs> I, I will say missed missed dramatic opportunity. I always felt this of he 
correct me if I'm wrong, he never finds out about what Ash Tyler really was, and yet he was the person that yeah. found him. No, yeah, I don't think he does. You're right. Had a close yeah. You're right. Yeah. 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 It always, um, it always rubbed me raw because I'm like, how would he feel? I want to know how he would react to that. Like, would he be a dick about it? How would he feel com complicated? It's just one of those things where I wanted to see that play out, and then they didn't do it. It's like, oh well, we just yeah. we just shot him. We shot him. <laughs> we just shot Lork. He's dead. Throw him. Um, throw him into the. And that's thing. why we needed Stabbed longer him. seasons. Yeah. 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 yeah right. Yeah. Um, there you go. I want to get to our last question of the day, and uh, this comes from Jordan Laforden. I like this one. We've seen many other officers get the con when captain and first officer off ship, Ariam, Detmer, Reese, Nielsen. If you and your number one were on an away mission, which Discovery crew member would you like to see take the con? And I'm just going to, because this is our last question, I'm going to just uh, tell, uh, go in an order here. Uh, Ryan, who would you like to see? Um, it's, it's a tough choice. I mean, Commander Nan D is the yum yum yes. lady. It would be wrong not to choose her. Um, Second runner-up, though, is Nilsson's wig. I think that's <laughs> this character. It survives flamethrowers being shot at it. It's such a... I mean, yes, it looks sweaty and old, but, like, that wig is super reliant. Uh, but, no, I have to... I mean, it has to be... I love I love Nan. She's just such a yeah. Yeah. <laughs> such a blank slate character. Like every right every time that she's in, it feels like a different writer's doing something with her. Like does does <laughs> does, does anyone remember that she was the engineer from the Enterprise? I sure do, but I don't think the show remembers that. Yeah. <laughs> she's a security lady with awesome makeup, and I don't mean just alien design. I mean she she has awesome makeup <laughs> when she rocks up in season three and four. Yeah. But uh, I think she would be fun. Uh, I think she knows her shit. Yeah, nice, Drew. Oh, uh, a Wilsercon. Yes. You know, let's let's give her some love. They they, uh, her and Detmer. I felt like uh, they were kind of underutilized in the first couple seasons, and we finally started to get some depth for both of them. And I think out of the two, uh, Wilsercon was the one that I uh, wanted to to learn the more the most about. Um, you know, they 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 gave her some some badass elements. You know, when she was fighting in the uh, gritty underground. Uh, yeah. so I feel like she's got it. You know, she can, she can make a good captain someday. Let's, let's give her the con every now and again. Like it, mm. like it, David. Uh, I would say for me, it would be Depper, Kayla Depper. Um, she's a pilot, which always helps. Uh, two, she has been through a great deal, uh, internally and externally where we saw a little bit of her story arc of dealing with so much of the trauma that the crew of the discovery went through. Uh, and number two, uh, also personally in the event that, uh, say for example, I get in a fight and lose a bet on free cloud and Heather has to bail me out of jail for an episode. Uh, Jordan LaForden. Hi, it's David. You have the con. Hi, Jordan. Uh, I like it. I like it. Awesome. Awesome. Mariah. Uh, Linus, obviously. No, I'm I was going to um, say Linus. Yes. <laughs> yes. We love um, Linus. I would probably also go with Owashikun. I, I think um, they've done like a lot of character development with her. I think we're going to get more in this next season. She was raised by Luddites, but is also a badass fighter. Seems to really have her wits about her. So yeah, I'd go with Owo. Nice. Nice. Heather? Uh, so I know he's not necessarily a member of the bridge crew, but I am always a Paul Stamets guy. So yeah. Stamets is my guy. Like yeah. it, like it, like it, like it. GD? Same. It's it's always going to be Stamets for me. Nice. Uh, yeah, uh, Stamets just level-headed and uh, brilliant. And, you know, uh, he just seems like the right guy to do it. Yeah. He's not, he's not going to leave me behind. He didn't, he didn't leave his husband behind. Nope. You know? True. So. True. Yep. Nice. All right, Joe. Um. So I also wanted Dimmer, but I really like Tig Nataro, so I would throw the engineer. Killing it. All right. So yeah, that's who I'm putting nice. in, man. That's it. Um. Mariah. She would in that chair. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Oh, please, God, no, no. no. Uh, <laughs> Mariah took Linus for me. I, I would say Linus as long as he doesn't shed in the chair, but. Um, <laughs> But uh, honestly, though, and and the name is escaping me. Uh, no, it's not. Think about this for a second. After events of season four, Zora. 
Mm. Yeah. yeah. Right. Mm. Yeah. A, member, a member of the crew. Technically an, AI, an officer. Yeah. Technically <laughs> an officer. And I think could get the job done. Right. You keep everybody comfortable in the spots that they know and you let her take command. I think it's uh, I think it could work. I think it could work. Um, that is going to do it for our captains of Discovery Pals. I want to thank each and every one of you for joining. This was such an amazing conversation. Uh, I, I'm so glad that we did this. Before we go, I'm going to give each of you the opportunity to say where people can find you. We will go in reverse order this time. Joe, where can people find you in Captain's Quadrant? You can find me and my co-hosts, Jason Roy Gaston and Jason Patswell. Yes, two Jasons and a Joe. We are not a law firm, but we are a Star Trek podcast. We are hanging out in the Captain's Quadrant. Yes, I, I wear this shirt so I can shift it just like Picard, but I keep my badge on. <laughs> Uh, nice. uh, we are doing the fun things in the agony booth where we go and we watch the worst of Star Trek episodes and have a delight in remember all in the good and bad of it. So the two Jasons and I, Jason is another fellow Australian and we just jump right into it. Very fun segments, bumpers, so much fun. Be sure to check us out at the captain's quadrant. Just Google captain's quadrant. Awesome. GD. Uh, you can find Drew and I at yet another Star Trek pod. Uh, we're on every available social media network, with the exception of OnlyFans. Drew and I are disagreeing on that. <laughs> that uh, makes some great yeah. content there. <laughs> Miss an opportunity. Latinum is Latinum, guys. Yeah, Latinum is Latinum. Latinum. <laughs> Join our OnlyFans um, to see my com badge. Uh, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's uh, it's you can see his uh, his 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 tattoo on his uh, on his calves, which are also there you go. Nice. Um, well, we are at yet another ST pod on every known platform with the exception again of, uh, of that oh, and truth social. We're not on true social yet. Good, uh, Brad good. was trying to get us on. Um, it's big Lee. You should be on, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's, uh, it's normally when we're at full capacity, it's, uh, two Trekkies and a, and a star Wars nerd talking about star Trek from the very beginning. Um, and occasionally we'll drift off and we'll have a bit of uh, <laughs> Futurama references and it's always sunny references. Oh, but, uh, nice. We, uh, yeah, we're, we're all over we're the there. place. We're, awesome. we're all over the place. Awesome. Yeah. Heather. Well, you can find the podcast at Prom Trek Pod. Uh, that's easier to say than Promenade Merchants, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> But uh, you can find that on most social media accounts, primarily Twitter. I refuse to call it X. Sorry, Elon. Um, and sorry, not really. sorry. Not sorry, really. not sorry. Yeah. And you can hurt. find me at NerdyGal33. And, uh, you know, we occasionally record podcasts every two weeks and talk about Star Trek and random wrestling references, which most star trek fans probably wouldn't get but that's okay <laughs> except for me because i'm all in it brother oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> me and my timeless era okay nice. there you go nice. love it love it mariah yes you can uh listen to me talk some more about star trek over at star trek discovery pod we are on social media on instagram and on twitter at star trek pod uh, because we've been doing this since 2017, so we got that nice handle. <laughs> um, never change it. Never well, change it. No, never um, changing well it. Um, well and I am on uh, the internets as well at Mariah Gossett. That's uh, Mariah with a Y and Gossett with two S's and two T's. Yay, David! Anything to add? Heather is great. <laughs> I make bad jokes. <laughs> there it is, Drew. I'll ask you the same question. Anything to add? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you can follow me on OnlyFans. Uh, <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, just uh, get another stpod.com uh, would be the easiest way to get to all of our stuff. And as Judy said, we're pretty much everywhere. Awesome. Awesome. And finally, Ryan. Uh, you can find my podcast, Yum Yum Pod or Yum Yum Podcast on all of those social medias. We are also on all of the podcasting sites youtube as well we have our patreon in which we do bonus content for people over there where you can hear our minds slowly deteriorate as we went through star trek picard uh that hasn't made it to the main feed but yeah we watch uh science fiction tv and we talk about it we've done discovery we just finished babylon 5 
we did Space Above and Beyond, and that was a great series for us. Uh, not a lot of people have covered that, and That's a we have exclu yeah. exclusive interviews with uh, the cast and crew from that. Uh, we even got to talk to Glenn Morgan, who mentioned how Starfleet Academy back in the day made it hard to make science fiction shows because they weren't allowed to make sci-fi shows uh, about academies or training or anything Ugh. because they're making the Starfleet Academy show, so you can't uh, do it yourselves. And I'm like, yeah, well, 40 years ago. <laughs> that was 30 years ago. They're still at Dude. it. They're still at it. So, oh. but uh, yeah, Yum Yum Pod or Yum Yum Podcast. We are going through the Expanse right now. We are first timers with the Expanse and we're so having good. So good. a great, a great so time. Good. I love... So I love Aaron Wright. He's my favorite character. So you can Aaron hear me talk right. about Sean Doyle in two <laughs> roles on our podcast. Uh, so, and I loved him in both. So there we are. Yum, yum podcast. Awesome. Awesome. And I am Julian. You can find strange new pod at strange new and at strange new pod, literally everywhere on the internet, uh, including only fans. No kidding. Nice. Uh, no. <laughs> No. Uh, guys. Um, Heather, Heather, I think we might have no, something to talk about. No, I think you're on no, something. No, no, no. Yeah. No. Okay. I know Jason. Um, no. One of the Jasons will be on. Fair enough. Okay. Folks, Ask this, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. We will see you uh, for the rest of the festival and the next show. Take care. Goodbye. Live long and prosper. Bye. Live logs and proper, everybody. Bye.